Okay, so we've talked about units, measurement, and uncertainty. Let's talk about motion. So we want to describe all kinds of cool stuff in the world. We begin with describing motion. Um, Galileo paused and thought about motion. Apparently he was in the, uh, in the church watching the candles, chandeliers going back and forth, not paying attention, I assume. And uh, timing it, but he didn't have a watch, right? He had pulse, pulse, and create water drop clocks and things like that, and describe motion. So what I want you guys to do now is to pause, really pause, walk around, notice motion. I mean, what would you say? Maybe you learned these terms, but if you just watch motion, how would you break this down? How, how would you break that down? What would you talk about? What would you measure? Um, as you as you describe motion. So what we're talking about is kinematics, and that word means motion. It's like cinema, kinema, which is moving pictures, and it's like kinesiology, which is the study of human movement. So that comes up kinetic energy, energy of motion. We'll get to that later. So all we're going to do is describe the motion, not say why things move the way they do, not say why things turn, speed up, or slow down. Not that, but just describing the motion for now. And this is going to be important. We can describe the motion of sound, the motion of light, uh, electrons, etc. So what I want you to do is pause, really, and contemplate. Watch, notice, contemplate, break down the motion. And what do you see when you move? Okay? So you pause. Now you're back. Okay. So you've done that, right? You just just kind of look at things. What what can you notice? We can notice certain things, like you can notice that things can move in one dimension. I can move forward and backward that way, or I can move forward and backward this way. I can move up and down that way. You can move also, come on over here, along a ramp. Galileo did some experiments with the ramp. Go up or down. Now it's true it's going up and over, but this is still along a straight line, so we call that one-dimensional motion. And we'll start with uh, working one-dimensional motion, you'll develop a, a variety of skills, and then we'll talk about two-dimensional motion, not along a straight line, but going up and over and down and over, up and over and down and over, so that's a long motion on a plane, or moving along a plane like this. So things that move, like Crabs. And then we can have a race. So we'll describe motion and describe these things, realizing that we're building our way up to some uh, very useful stuff. And we can race the crab, can race the moving nose. And uh, then we can have a flying nose and ask, where does it land? How far does it go? How long does it take? And so on. So we'll time things and measure things. And there goes my nose. Oh, falling off. Okay, so we can have three-dimensional motion. We can have motion like this, right? So this thing can drop, and while it's dropping, it can spin. And then it can go up and spin. So we can describe that kind of motion. Spinning motion, rotating motion, oscillating. We can go around on a circle. Or we can have the, the object spin like this. We can go back and forth. Pendulum or a spring. So all these ideas, these more complex motions, will need to be described using the basics. So, okay, the description of motion, we're just going to describe it. So in order to do that, we need some clear definitions. We can't be fuzzy about our language. Now you can define words however you want, but once you've defined them and we all agree that we're using this word to mean this, then, then we've got to be consistent. So let's go over here to this list of motions or excuse me, terms. The terminology of kinematics, the description, just describing motion. First, of course, there's time. Now, 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 looking at the clock, looking at the camera. There's instants of time, and there's intervals of time. Now, this is, gets tricky, surprisingly tricky. Confuse people, if you want to look something up, look Zeno's paradox. It's not a paradox, really, to those of us that have studied uh, uh, calculus and, uh, and physics, 
But it was a paradox, and if you haven't studied that, there are some philosophers that still consider it a paradox, but it really isn't. But there's some interesting things in here. Space. So position, where are you located? And for that, we'll need a reference compared to what? I mean, here compared to that TV or that uh, eraser or that word or whatever. Displacement, change in position, independent of that. And distance. These are all different things. So we have to treat them carefully. And then there's movement. How fast you're moving, roughly, but rate of travel. There's the velocity at any instant, and then it's the average velocity. There's the speed at any instant, slightly different. And then there's the average speed, which is often quite a bit different than the average velocity. So different terms. Velocity is your speed and direction at any instant. So the speed leaves out the direction. The average velocity and average speed are different. We'll have to be careful about that. And then the rate, not of motion, but the rate at which you change motion, the rate at which you speed up, the rate at which you slow down, the rate at which you turn, um, called acceleration. And that can be a constant acceleration, gradually slowing down, gradually speeding up, gradually turning at a constant rate. Or it can be changing acceleration, kind of jerky. And we can look at the average acceleration. And those are the main concepts to describe motion. There are some subtleties and some tricks and some things that will mess with your head, too. So let's go over here and just start to lay this out. I've got a handout for you. and uh, we really clearly lay this out, and we'll do lots of problems. Uh, beginning with kinematics concepts and measurements, things that we would measure. So for time, space, let's start there. We can look at how we represent those mathematically in algebraic equations, right? These variables. We can see how we can draw motion drive diagrams, kind of like a video, but, you know, a, a video on paper showing something here, something here, something here, something here, etc. Positions that uh, occur at different times. And then we have graphs versus time. We'll be going into all this. Okay, so just, this is just an orientation in kinematics. So the first thing with time is instants. And I like to call them states. We use that terminology a lot in thermodynamics, for example. We'll use some things in quantum mechanics, events. We'll use that terminology for relativity. But instants, or states, at each moment, what's happening, what's true. Versus intervals, or an elapsed time, an interval of time, from now until now. From when I release, till when, just before I catch it, or don't. Um, so the interval of time, how long something took uh, from the time that it reaches the top till the time just before it hits my hand uh, elapsed. So how do we represent that? We represent this with math variables. Now, I. Because this can be so confusing to people, uh, and it's kind of an unconscious confusion, so it keeps haunting them, they don't know what's the problem. What I do is I use a certain terminology. Uh, T, of course, is good for time. And I use lowercase e to mean earlier, an earlier time. T, lowercase l, oh, excuse me, uppercase l, uppercase e. Uh, for later. This is a later time. So in a general equation, I might have an earlier time and relate it to a later time. And often our equations relate two states, two moments, in the process from an earlier time to a later time. Now, a lot of books might use I for initial and F for final. Um, I really don't like that. Uh, they can also use O or not, the British word N-A-U-G-H-T meaning nothing, not, all for not, uh, T not. And that's fine, but sometimes we'll have problems and processes where we'll look at something moving. Like, I'll throw something, right when I let go, 
that's a particular time. And then it kind of goes along through its flight. And I can look at any time. So for me, I might call this T1 or T0, T sub 0. Either one's fine. And then it's going here. And I might call that T2. And then it's going here. And I might call that T3. So if 1 is earlier than 2, 1 is earlier than 3. I can relate any of those. T4. So I like to keep track of a process and give myself that flexibility to relate earlier to any of the later states, 1 to 4, 1 to 3, 2 to 4, 2 to 3, 3 to 4. Right? Um, but clearly, one's earlier and later. So in the equations, I like to generally write E and L. You can do as you choose, but I kind of recommend uh, adopting this in general. Then when I do the equation specifically, I'll say, OK, from 1 to 2, here's what I've got. From 2 to 4, here's what I've got. And then I can clearly identify which two moments in time or instance I'm talking about. So. Now the crazy thing about motion and instance is that in, at an instant, at a state, you have a certain direction and a certain speed. And you can't change. Because at that moment, boom, you are moving at a certain speed in a certain direction. But you can be changing. And that's kind of the essence of Zeno's paradox. At any moment, or, or another way of looking at that, at any moment, you can be changing, but you can't change. Okay. So we'll talk about that uh, later. So we, we write this this way. Now, if I want to talk about an interval of time, the worst case books will talk about an interval of time from earlier to later, initial to final, one to three, whatever it is. They'll just use T. And that's really horrible. It's fine to work the mathematics that way if you know what you're doing. But when you're learning it, this is a change in time. Now, I like the notation earlier to later, a little arrow there. And what that means, if you have the specific, you know, if it's two seconds, it's two seconds, 2.39 seconds, 2.39, that's fine. I don't really care what the earlier T was. But any change is going to be a later minus an earlier. So if you want, you could also write it out this way. And you want to make it specific, that could be delta t uh, from 2 to 4. And then you're really clear, you keep in mind where on your picture these variables refer to. And that's a critical thing. Okay? So that's the sort of care that we need. Okay? On motion diagrams, we can show space. For example, in one dimension, we can imagine moving along one dimension. And we can start out here, one, and then some time travels. And you can imagine a strobe, you know, flash of light, and you see it there, and then you look here, and there's two, and maybe back here it's three, and so on. And that'd be a motion diagram. From one to two, the time might be different than two to three. If 1 to 2 has the same time as 2 to 3 and 3 to 4, then we call that a strobe picture, where it's like flash on, flash off, flash on, flash off. Every second, you take a picture, every 2 seconds, every 10 seconds, whatever it is, every nanosecond, whatever it is. So we can do this. And of course, we can do this in two dimensions, too. And uh, we can define our coordinates how we really what we want. X and Y, this could be vertical, this could be looking down on the page. Something could start out here, one, two, three, four, and that's just something moving through space. Now the other way we're going to do this, and we're going to get into this 
a little bit later is graphs versus time. So we often graph time on this axis, and we can graph things like position, velocity, and acceleration versus time. So we need to talk about those sorts of things. So we're going to relate earlier and later moments in time, and we're going to look at things like position, displacement, distance, velocity, acceleration, and so on. Um, as we describe the motion of something, not saying why it's moving that way. And that's it for your intro to kinematics. Now let's get to work.